because our next speaker is constantly on the run. I've been trying to chase him for the last 15 years, ever since he began Object Management Group, now wearing his much more important hat as Executive Director of the Industrial Internet Consortium, Dr. Richard Soley. Please, thunderous applause. Enjoy. Good to see you. Why much more important? I'd like to know the details of that. We're going to have a little conversation afterwards. So um, I'm going to talk about the Industrial Internet Consortium. How many of you have heard of the Industrial Internet Consortium? OK, I'm not going to talk about it in that case. All right, fine. For the, you can go to sleep. I'm going to talk to the rest of you. Um, uh, how many of you saw uh, we're here for Bosch Connected World in this room, actually, in February? OK, good. So we got some, well, you can go to sleep completely then, absolutely. Um, I, I'm going to start with a, a little bit of background. Um, I, I think Moshe gave a, a, great, a great bit of background. I'm also going to pace around the stage, by the way, just to see how good the camera is at following me. Um, and the jokes will get better, I promise. Um, um, in 1995, a very famous man made a, made a, a statement to a, a member of the press. His name's Bill Gates. I'm sure some of you have heard of him. William S. Gates, the 237th. Look, you've got to laugh at at least one every few minutes, or I'll stop. That's it, okay. Um, in 1995, he told the press, you know, I don't know why I would have an internet division. That would be like having an electric division. I remember thinking in 1995 that um, I had just been reading a book about the history of adoption of electrical technology, and between 1900 and 1910, quite a few companies did have electrical divisions. In fact, companies like uh, Procter & Gamble, Colgate, Palmolive had electricity divisions. The purpose of those divisions was to figure out what are we going to do with this new technology? How is it going to affect our operations, our manufacturing operations, our retail operations, our distribution operations, and so forth? There's not uh, much of an electrical department left in these big companies. Actually, there is. Um, the head of that department is usually called the janitor. He replaces light bulbs. There's something to be learned from that, and that is that change can affect you, as Moshe was saying in, in quite, quite correctly. Um, and he posed it as a change for the CIO, he posed it as a change for the CEO, but I think actually it's a change for quite a few other people in the organization as well. So 1999, Bill Gates uh, did a, a complete turnaround, and he said, um, uh, he wrote a letter to all of his employees, you may, have, you may have seen it, he said, a fundamental new rule for business is that the internet changes everything. How many of you agree with that? The internet changes everything. <laughs> You're going to learn not to answer my questions. Um, I, I don't actually think that's true, but let, let's see some examples where, where it has. So here are some examples where the internet has changed everything. At the top of that list there is listening to music, right? We used to use all sorts of devices, and I, I know that turntables are coming back into, into practice, and some of you are using these black plastic albums, but you're insane. Um, and uh, and uh, some of you are old enough to remember boom boxes, you know, those big things you walk down the street with on your shoulder. Yeah, I see some people with the same amount of hair that I have, so I know that there are some people in the, here that remember that. Now that's not how we listen to music. We don't listen to music on physical things at all. I mean, I, like many of you, I have a large CD collection. I keep it in the basement, never look at it again, because they've all been ripped to MP3 and, and illegally... Uh, no, I won't finish that statement. Um, <laughs> Now we listen to music on, on electronic equipment, on, on computers. And it probably doesn't look like that laptop. Um, it probably, or that's a desktop, I guess. It probably looks something more like this, right? We carry around our music. Yeah, some of you are looking, some of the younger ones in here are looking at the, what the hell is he doing with a Blackberry? I'll, I'll <laughs> I love this phone. I can never leave this phone. It's, it's four years old, but no, really, um, you should look at Blackberry. They make some great devices. I just like Canadians, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Watching a movie has changed. Uh, my, uh, my, my kids, 24 and 26 years old, I'm pretty sure they don't realize that television is broadcast over the air, and they certainly don't have cable. Um, they watch television by downloading uh, shows completely legally from the internet um, and watching them. Um, they, they, that's just how they watch movies. Um, uh, in, in the United States, we used to have these things called, um, what were they called, newspapers. We used to have these things called newspapers. Um, um, right, you actually still have newspapers here, that's good. Um, I would have read uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung this morning, but I can't read German. Um, 
uh, that um, and now we I mean, it's not like people don't read news anymore we read news on the on the network I the only news uh, newspaper that I get on paper at home is my local little town newspaper because I love newspapers that have front page stories of lightning striking the tree in the middle of town so these markets have completely changed even making music has completely changed and, and I'm sure many of you use Skype as well that, uh, so making telephone calls has changed. Um, I, I was in the founding team of a company called PictureTel, the first, six, first successful picture telephone company. We thought it was really cool that you could transmit live, or nearly live, uh, um, video um, on the network in 1984, when I was two years old. Um, you're not supposed to laugh at that one. Uh, and. Um, uh, nowadays, of course, with, with Skype and, uh, and FaceTime and so forth, that's not a big deal. So these markets have completely changed. I mean, in the United States, for example, there are almost no bookstores left, and you're losing bookstores as well. You can walk over to Media Markt and, uh, across the street, and you can see that they still have a few books, but mostly they sell other things. That's a huge change. That's an enormous change, um, but there are markets where there has been no change at all. So here's a market that I worked in in the 1970s, before I was born. Um, that, uh, anybody recognize that, by the way? Anybody? It's called a Programmable Logic Controller, PLC for short. I see some hands up over there. Those people are very old, except for you. You didn't work with PLCs, I don't believe it. They were very different. It's a computer, by the way. Inside it, in fact, this is a Modicon 584. Um, it, inside it is a Motorola 68000 chip, 68010 to be specific. It was, um, it looks like a computer, it feels like a computer, but in fact it was not a computer, it was operational technology. The way you program it was completely different. For example, that's the programming language for PLCs and still is. Um, it's called ladder diagrams. But more importantly, it didn't integrate with the other computers in the plant or anywhere else. If I wanted to take information from my PLC and use it to do just-in-time delivery or to manage flow through the plant or safety in the plant, I couldn't do it without printing it out walking across the floor and typing it back into a manufacturing resource planning system, or MRP system, now called ERP systems. Here's the strangest thing. Fast forward to 2015, and you get a, a box that's not that much different. Um, the sides are made of plastic instead of metal now. Uh, it's, uh, the company, um, it, Modicon, has been bought and sold many times, and it's now called Schneider Automation. Yes, that's right. It's a French company with a German name in the United States. Um, <laughs> The way you program it has not changed. It now has network connectors on it because it speaks a bunch of different things like Modbus that some of you may have heard of. But it's still true, it's still true that it doesn't integrate with the information technology in the plant. There's been no internet thinking. Nobody thought, how can we use the cheap internet technology? I mean, you can get a TCP IP router from your local Staples store for five euro these days. But nobody's thought, how can we do that? How can we use that on the plant and, and on the plant floor? And you should be able to. There are lots of examples in the electric market, for example. You, um, the, these the electric grids have not changed since at least the 1950s. I would argue since the 1920s. And there's another example, a jet engine. This is what the inside of a jet engine looks like. Since the 1960s, there has been all kinds of there have been all kinds of efficiency sensors inside a jet engine to track what's going on inside the engine. A jet engine today lands with as much as a terabyte of data um, on the engine, and um, uh, you, could use that in, you can use that information to make the engine more efficient or make sure that it keeps flying, for example. In 1960, the way you got that information was you downloaded it with a cable, you looked at it, and you decided if it looked okay, and if it looked okay, you let the plane go again. In 2015, it hasn't really changed. You can download it with a USB key. You can look at that data on a laptop. If it looks kind of, uh, there might be a problem, then you might send it off to the jet engine manufacturer, whether it's Rolls-Royce or Pratt & Whitney or CFM or whomever. Uh, and they might look at it at the end of the shift or maybe the end of the week or maybe end of the month and say, oh my God, we better find N5273 because the left engine's about to fail and the plane's gonna fall out of the sky. Kind of a problem even if it's not about falling out of the sky, because jet engines are amazingly efficient and, uh, and amazingly reliable today, you can certainly make that jet engine more efficient if you make sure all of the compressor blades are not bent. If you make sure that you've got the right bypass going through on the high bypass section. Sorry, I love jet engines because airplanes are cool. It's just a thing. There are lots of other examples. I'm not gonna read these examples to you. Um, in oil and gas, there's all kinds of exciting things about oil and gas exploration and exploitation. Um, if, for example, there's not a lot of compute power on most, uh, 
uh, on most oil and gas exploration platforms in the water because, well, because they're in the water and water's not good for computers. I know I've tried it. Um, there are other examples like uh, uh, rail and, and, and so forth. Actually, in this room in February of this year, uh, General Electric executive proudly stated that General Electric um, locomotives, diesel electric locomotives, collect nine million points of data every second. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. When he came off the stage, I asked him how many of them are used. He said three, and I said, wow, a third. That's not bad, actually. He said, no, three. The point is there's enormous amounts of data and a lack of internet thinking to use that data to connect our operational systems with our information systems. And to get there, we can do a better job. We've seen this before. Uh, whether you call it Industry 4.0 or whether you call it cyber physical systems or whether you call it in Internet of Things or whether you have Cisco branded on your forehead and you call it Internet of Everything. That's a Cisco brand, by the way. I use it with her politely. Um, we've seen these kinds of changes before. So, in the late 19th century, there was a revolution. That revolution was called the Industrial Revolution. It was about moving human brawn to machines, right? To steam at first, and then to petroleum-based economy, in, uh, internal combustion, and so forth. The net result of that was an enormous leap in productivity, depending on which economist you believe, and I don't believe any of them, but the leap was somewhere between two and a half and four times, two and a half and four times, not percent, times, a huge productivity leap. There was also a uh, social impact, by the way. I don't know how many of you have read about the Webers or if you've read about the Luddites in the UK. They went around trying to destroy these new automated looms because they were destroying jobs. Many jobs were destroyed and far more jobs were created, not just because those looms had to be built, the automated looms had to be built and maintained and repaired and so forth, but also this enormous productivity leap led to a huge leap in consumer demand, which led to the need for more people to be hired. So the Industrial Revolution actually created far more jobs than it destroyed, although it, there, you, it did destroy jobs, and we do, you do have to watch what revolutions do um, to your economy. It happened again in the late 20th century with the Internet Revolution. The Internet Revolution moved human connectivity to machine connectivity. Not really intelligence, I wouldn't claim. It did have that same effect of two and a half to four times productivity leap. That's the interesting thing. And it did destroy jobs, for example, in bookstores and reporters and, and all sorts of other jobs. It did create new jobs as well. I'm always asked by reporters, well, what new jobs are created? And I remind them, in, in 1990, there were not a whole lot of webmasters. Just one, his name was Tim. Now his name is Sir Tim, and there are a lot of webmasters with him. If you can harness internet thinking and apply it to industrial systems, I think we're headed towards a third revolution. Industrial systems, internet thinking, industrial internet. Very simple idea. So that's why we call it the industrial internet, um, and that, that's the background. We think we're going to see another huge leap in productivity, uh, and uh, we think that that's going to come from the industrial sectors. As Moshe said, um, there's been very little impact in the industrial sectors of this kind of internet thinking. There's there are enormous opportunities. Um, I, that's not to say that there aren't opportunities in consumer systems. I'm sure many of you are wearing Fitbits. How many of you are wearing Fitbits? Just the people who have learned to answer my questions, yes. And how many of you actually look at that Fitbit ever except to look at the time? You're a liar. Um, did I keep telling you, don't raise your hand, you'll get stuck with me. There's a market in consumer systems, but the margin is in industrial systems. More importantly, there's been no impact in industrial systems to date. Let's look at what that impact might be. It depends on which, oh, I hate builds, excuse me. Uh, it depends on, depends on who you believe. Um, I'm, these are, again, economists, and the dismal sciences typically doesn't create a lot of uh, numbers that any of us believe, but let's look at some of them anyway. General Electric did an analysis in 2012. It was published by their chief economist, not, not by an engineer. His name is Marco Annunziata. You can find the report on the web. If you can't find it, I'll be happy to send it to you. He said uh, in, 19, in 2012, sorry, I'm old, in 2012, uh, the world economy was about 70 trillion U.S. dollars, 70 million million U.S. dollars. And he said 46% of that could be affected by the industrial internet, by applying internet thinking to industrial systems. That's $32.3 trillion. A 1% swing in $32.3 trillion is a mere $323 billion a year. 
Um, what's that today? 320 billion euro. I was being nasty, sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, Cisco says it'll add 21% to private sector profits and $19 trillion to the global economy by 2020. That's only five years away, ladies and gentlemen. There's something worth looking at. Gartner says $300 billion um, it, by, two, by 2020. McKinsey says $36 trillion in operating costs affected by uh, IoT impacted on industrial systems. It's a market worth looking at. Where does that come from? Let's get down to serious issues. Where, where is that coming from? Well, you heard some of that already this morning. I actually think the most interesting place is that we move to an outcome-based economy. There's a whole new way to buy and sell products as services. For example, jet engines, because remember, jet engines are cool. If you go to General Electric today and say, I want to buy a jet engine for my plane, or probably two, or sometimes four, They'll say, we'll sell it to you the way we've always sold it to you, which is about 80% of the cost of the engine up front, and then we'll sell you parts and, uh, parts and services to the tune of about four or five times the cost of the engine over the next 40 or 50 years, the life of the engine. But if you prefer, we'll lease it to you. And the lease will not be a, a timed lease, it will be a lease based on thrust hours, that is tens of thousands of pounds of thrust, for a certain number of hours. Yes, they still measure it in pounds. It's not my fault, it's theirs. Divide by two, close enough, it's kilos. The point is, they will also guarantee the fuel use of that engine. And in case of General Electric, they will actually decrease the fuel use guarantee by 1% every year for the life of the lease. How can they do that? Well, normally when a manufacturer makes something like a jet engine, they sell it to a, a, a wholesaler, who's a distributor who sells it to a wholesaler, who sells it to a retailer, who sells it to another retailer, who sells it to a value-added re, uh, reseller, who sells it to the end customer, and there's no relation between the manufacturer and the customer. In the world, in this world, however, an outcome-based economy, the manufacturer keeps that relationship with the device, keeps that relationship with the consumer. In the case of this lease, for example, General Electric continues to own the engine. Rolls-Royce does the same thing, by the way. They keep that engine, they lease that engine out, but they are the ones that maintain the engine, and guess what? They're taking data from that engine every single day to make sure it's at the top possible, the highest possible efficiency, and that it keeps flying, of course. That's a huge change. Um, that's a revenue recognition change. It just changed the way companies report their revenue. It's a change to everything about the way the company operates. It also leads to a situation in where products no longer fail. At least that jet engine won't fail. I think we're 40 years away, but probably in my lifetime even, at a place where products don't fail, or if they do fail, we get a replacement product or a replacement part before it fails. Because we keep that connection between the manufacturer, who knows a lot more and can do predictive maintenance on that device um, than they ever knew before. That's the simple idea of Internet of Things, by the way. It's not a complex idea. Take information from a large number of sensors, potentially worldwide. Do real-time predictive analytics on that information, and then apply it directly to actuators or, or deliver visualization to decision and decision support to decision makers. That's it. It's a really simple pattern. This is General Electric's numbers, on the, and, and I think their report is very readable. That's why I use this report. This was published in 2012. It was a 15-year outlook on General Electric products only just to give you a feel for the impact that these changes can make, especially when you look at an out outcome-based economy. 15-year savings in jet fuel, 30 billion US dollars. Two billion dollars a year. I know, it's not much. It's a lot. 66 billion dollars in, uh, in diesel fuel. That's an enormous change. So those are, those are ships, uh, those are diesel engines in, in factories and so forth. Um, I mean, I'm not going to read all of these, so there, this is my favorite number, actually. 68% decrease in crime um, in police forces that move to cameras on, every, on the shoulder of every policeman. Multiple reasons why that might be true. We're not going to discuss them. Um, the one that I like the best, actually, is this one. $63 billion in liability savings in healthcare. I like that one not just because it's a huge number, Right, that's a 15-year number, more than $4 billion a year in savings from healthcare liability, but also because we're talking about saved lives. And I'll have a, an example of that at the end here. So how do we achieve this? Uh, Moshe did a good job talking about the technology and what's going on in IBM's laboratories in Rushlikon, um, but 
um, it's important to realize that it's not just the research laboratories, it's not just the academics, it's not just the standards organizations, it's not just the technology vendors, it's the mining companies and the banks and the manufacturing companies. They somehow have to build the relationships to work together, figure out what works and what doesn't work, and then apply that to real living systems. That's hard. You could hope that they would all create these one-on-one -on -one relationships and find a way to work together and end up with the same solution, but we know they won't. So the purpose of the Industrial Internet Consortium, which, uh, which I lead, was to bring them together to build test beds. What do I mean by test beds? I mean we have to actually build things and see what works and doesn't work. These are transformational outcomes. The only way to figure out what's tr what's transform what can be done, whether it's from a small company, as Moshe talked about, or whether it's from a large company, the only way to get there and to fail fast is to figure out what can and can't be done and then try something else. So we bring together the standards organizations and the software companies and the hardware companies and the mining companies and the manufacturing companies to try it out. March 27th, 2014, we created this organization. The founders were IBM, Intel, Cisco, AT&T, and General Electric. Three vendors of technology, two major users of technology. With this mission statement, don't read the whole thing. The last three words are the important part, transformational business outcomes. Not a standards organization. The purpose is, find what works. How can this technology change the way we do business and make more money, but also deliver higher customer satisfaction? These five founding members thought that today we would be about 80 members, uh, they were a year and a half later now, uh, we, and, and we'd have hopefully about two or three test beds that we could talk about. In fact, things have moved a little bit faster than we expected. Today, there were 215 member companies. Uh, those five, member, five founding members were joined not only by these two contributing members, SAP and Schneider. I don't know why that changed, but. Um, and quite a few other uh, large companies. I like to point out that those large companies are not all technology providers like Qualcomm or technology uh, uh, integrators like Unisys. Um, or, uh, or, or uh, the Chinese companies like Hire or Japanese companies like Fuji. Upper left-hand corner, Kodelco, mines one-third of all the copper in the world. It's a mining company, one of the largest mining companies in the world. Why do they care? Because they care about doing a better job inside their mines, where it's kind of difficult to build networks, because those mines are copper mines, and Mr. Faraday says it's against the law to build a network inside a copper mine. Thank you to the engineers in the room who got that one. The, you'll explain it to all the others. Um, uh, th these companies are working together to build test beds. The reality is, however, it's not just big companies that have new ideas. As Moshe mentioned, it's uh, small companies as well. And today, 55% of our member companies are small. That is under 50 million US dollars or 50 million euro, what you might call Mittelstand companies. Um, these companies, I mean, you can look at this um, uh, any way you like. Um, you'll recognize some of them and you won't recognize many of them. But there are small banks in here. There are makers of RFID chips. There are software companies. There are, uh, there are communications companies and so forth. And we are also joined by several dozen organizations which are academic research organizations, uh, corporate research organizations, including, of course, Fraunhofer. Uh, um, and uh, government agencies in, in Taiwan and in the United States. And I think quite interestingly, uh, you know, uh, it's not listed there somewhere, it's somewhere it's listed, UL, uh, which is the uh, TUV, TUV of the United States, TUV, sorry, of the United States. Um, that is a testing organization because they realize that when there's IT information in every, in every organization and in every device, the way you test things is going to change. How do we get there? How do we get to those test beds? How do we build these prototypes, these demonstration systems? Well, first, you gotta bring together the ecosystem, and that's what we've done. As I said, about 215 companies today. Next, you have to de develop the reference models. We did develop a reference model. It's called, cleverly, the Industrial Internet Reference Architecture. Um, along with that, a, a set of security models and use cases for using Internet of Things technology and industrial systems. Our technology groups meet about once a week or once every two weeks, depending on the telephone, and once a quarter face-to-face. Uh, -face. So they met last week in Barcelona. Um, and um, the reality is most of that work, since it's going on all over the world, our membership is about 35% uh, in Europe, about 10% in, in Asia, um, the rest in, uh, in North America, a little bit in South America and Australia as well. 
Next step, build the test beds. As I said, we hoped we would be in a position today where we would be able to talk about two test beds from our 80 companies. Instead, our 215 member companies today have built 11 test beds, of which seven are public. The first one was announced here, not just Berlin, but here. Um, I stood here with uh, Dr. Demmer, the CEO of Bosch, and we uh, talked about this test bed called the Track and Trace test bed. Uh, it was jointly developed by Bosch and Tech Mahindra with the support of Cisco. Purpose was very simple. Use Cisco technology to locate everything on the manufacturing floor within one meter. Just locate everything on the factory floor, the parts, the people, the work in progress, and the tools. Did a demonstration actually right here on the floor. I think the device was sitting right here where they actually had a, a Bosch employee, Dirk Slama, who's speaking this afternoon, and you should hear him come speak, jumped up on stage and uh, picked up the tool and picked up a part and walked over to the device uh, that was being, uh, being built and started to put the, the part into the, into the work in progress. And uh, uh, the voice from above, actually in his Google glasses, said, no, that's the wrong part. Put it back in bin one, pick up a part from bin two. And then it said, by the way, you haven't been trained to use that tool. So it trained him on the fly to use the tool, at the, on the spot to use that tool. And when he was done with the tool, actually he used the tool and it stopped automatically at the correct torque for that part into that work in progress. And when he tried to walk off the floor, actually right over here, to take the tool with him, it, it said, woke up and it said, no, that tool is not supposed to leave this part of the factory floor. Simple ideas, but these simple ideas can streamline a factory, and Bosch is rolling this out not only in their own 240 factories worldwide, but in other companies' factories as well. That's pretty impressive with only one meter of resolution on the factory floor, and in fact, um, it's come to the end of phase one, and they're starting phase two of that test bed. Um, as I say, this was just announced in February, so it's only seven months old. Phase two is going to do the same thing, but locating devices on the floor within three millimeters, if they can find the technology. That's, a, that's an amazing change, not only to the efficiency of the factory, knowing what's in the right place and, and, not, and, and what parts of the factory floor are used, but also to the safety of the factory. These tools are dangerous. The, uh, the Bosch Rexroth tool that he actually had on stage can hurt you. The second uh, test bed that we uh, announced uh, soon afterwards is called Communications Control. It's a smart grid test bed. The idea is if we can build our electric grids smaller with a lot more intelligence, we can integrate forms of, of power generation that are not constant, like the forms of generation that we use today, nuclear, coal, oil, and so forth. By the way, don't tell me because of the energy venda, you're not using nuclear power. You are, you're just buying it from France. Shh, don't tell anyone. This test bed developed by National Instruments, RTI, and Cisco is building a set of test uh, cells in Southern California now with uh, Southern California Edison. If those work, they will roll it out live in San Antonio, Texas for the city of San Antonio. They'll be able to integrate aeolic energy, that's wind energy, solar energy, maybe thermal and, uh, and, and even tidal energy. But more importantly, they can use the power sources and the batteries that are within those microcells and also share energy back and forth live between the cells so they don't have to turn off power generation systems and they don't have to turn off neighborhoods. Uh, the third one we announced uh, just about uh, um, two months ago in Ireland, it's called the Infinite Test Bed. It's what we call a horizontal test bed. It integrates all of the, uh, of the, uh, of the IT resources in, the, in County Cork in Southern Ireland, a beautiful part of the country. They're going to be building a bunch of different applications on top of this horizontal test bed, but I think the one that interests me the most is the first one. They're simply integrating the IT resources of the hospitals and the National Health Services of Ireland with the ambulances. Today, if you call for an ambulance in County Cork, on the way to you, it doesn't know anything about you, and on the way back, it only knows that the people in the ambulance only know about, about you what you've been able to tell them or what people around you have been able to tell them. By the end of the year, on the way to picking you up, they will get all of your medical records delivered directly to the ambulance from the National Health Services or the and or the hospitals in County Cork. And they'll be able to treat you much better knowing if you're a diabetic, for example, or knowing if you have high blood pressure and so forth. So they're not just keeping you alive, but actually doing better. They'll be able to treat you properly. This one is, uh, is run by EMC with the support of Vodafone and County Cork itself. 
Uh, our condition monitoring and predictive maintenance test bed is, is the idea that we can, if we know much more about how anything works, a factory, a jet engine, and so forth, we can do predictive maintenance. We can say the situation today looks like situations we've seen thousands of times before in which a system failed, and so we know it's going to fail in the following way. So Moshe talked a little bit about that. I don't need to talk more about that, except that, no surprise, IBM is involved and with National Instruments. General Electric is running a high-speed network infrastructure test bed in which they've connected several of their major research laboratories at NISCA Unit New York, Shanghai, China, and so forth with multi-terabit per second uh, con connections. Once you have multi-terabit per, per second connections, there are far more things that you can do uh, when you don't have to worry about the transit time of information. I mean, think about entire uh, body x-rays, uh, CAT scans and MRIs transferring in less than a second. And our asset efficiency test bed, which was just announced two weeks ago, um, led by Infosys and Bosch with support from Intel and PTC, is actually saying, how can we generalize the capture of asset information so that we can maximize the use of assets more intelligently, also with predictive maintenance, with, with predict, uh, predictive accuracy? The point is, as I say, we have 11 of these test beds running. There's information about seven of them that's up on our website. We invite you to come take a look. Um, I'm obviously not going to talk in any more detail about them. If you're wondering what about standards, well, of course, obviously, the two issues in IoT, as everyone has already said, are interoperability, i.e. standards, and security. How do we get there? We could just start making standards, and there are organizations like 1M2M that have, start issue, have already started issuing IoT standards. The reality is we don't know exactly what standards we need. And if you start developing standards without knowing exactly what you need, you end up in the situation of standards, that's the great thing about standards. There are so many to choose from. Yeah, that's not really funny, I know. Uh, so what we've done at the Industrial Internet Consortium is build relationships with about 15 standards organizations. Uh, the first one was with the Object Management Group. That wasn't too hard since I chair that also. I signed both sides of the agreement. It was really, it was a funny day. My, my cap kept turning. But we've also signed agreements with the Eclipse Foundation, as you see. That's an open source organization, one of the largest in the world. Uh, the Smart Grid uh, Interoperability Platform, or SGIP, with Dean. Anybody heard of Dean? When we signed this agreement, I, uh, they said, by the way, we are now, anybody here from Dean? Okay, we'll make fun of them. Um, I, when we signed this agreement, they, uh, they, they told me, by the way, we are now an international standards organization. And I said, really, what does the D stand for? And he said, Dienst. Non-German speakers, you'll get an explanation from the German speakers later. With the open group, with the Open Interconnect Consortium, with Oasis, and so forth. The idea is, from the test beds, we will learn about disruptive new products and services, and we will also learn about standards we wish we had had, standards we wish were available, and we send those, those requirements over to standards organizations to help them prioritize the standards that they develop. We have started to deliver requirements already through something we call the Industrial Internet Interoperability Initiative. Uh, they came from the Bosch uh, Tech Mahindra testbed. Uh, they have to do with device management, and they're already being managed. Are, that work has already started at, at Object Management Group and other places to develop standards in those spaces. Why now? Uh, I think Moshe did a better job than I ever could to say why now. Um, but I will say, obviously, the convergence of Internet technology and, and operational technology is not a new idea. Um, it was called CAM. Before that, by the way, it was called uh, um, fl uh, cell manufacturing uh, or flexible manufacturing. It's had many different names. This time, however, we have free communications. I mean, I as I said, you can go into an office, uh, an office uh, um, building right now and, and get a, uh, a TCP IP router for about five euro. They cost nothing. The technology is zero cost and communications are ubiquitous. That's a huge change. Connected everything. A lot of presentations start with there are 70 billion, 100 billion, 50 trillion, a quadrillion, decillion sensors in the world. Don't care. That's not what's interesting. The interesting thing is what do we do with that information and how do we use that information to immediately do predictive analytics and deliver that to, to decision makers or actually actuate devices. Big data. The fact that I can start using big data on unstructured information with Hadoop today for free is amazing. Right? That, so this convergence of all these things is leading to smarter machines, smarter manufacturing, and smarter products. Uh, another build. Did I mention I hate builds? Um, I like to talk about that thing over on the right. Anybody know what that is? 
it's, in English it's called a pulse oximeter. These guys are saying some 47 syllable word in German, I have no idea. Pulse oximeter looks through your skin and your blood vessels and guesses how much oxygen is in your body, is, is, in, your, uh, is in your blood vessels. And I really mean guesses. Anybody happen to know what the, um, what the accuracy of these devices is? I will tell you, 80%. 20% of their guesses are wrong. Especially if you make the mistake of putting the blood pressure cuff and the pulse oximeter on the same arm. This is a very common mistake that is made all over the world, especially by very busy nurses in, uh, in uh, emergency rooms or in uh, intensive care units. Um, when the, pulse, uh, when the uh, blood pressure cuff blows up, it stops the blood movement to your arm, there's no more oxygen in your hand, and the pulse oximeter says, oh, he's dead. <laughs> and then a second later it says, not so dead. <laughs> Funny, but people die because of it. If you have an intensive care uh, unit nurse who's watching 60 patients, and he or she gets, the, uh, gets a, an, an alarm from a, uh, from a pulse oximeter that says there's no oxygen in this patient, you're gonna ignore the first one, maybe the second one, because you got four minutes after all. That's a bad thing, because sometimes it means I need to get in there now and do something about it. Unfortunately, there's no integrated pulse oximeter and blood pressure monitor in the world, zero. Uh, in, in, in actual use. There are laboratories that I've seen in Japan, in Europe, and in the United States to do that integration, but not actually allowed in use in hospitals yet, so people die. Again, we can do better, we should do better, but the reality is we're getting there. Things are actually coming together, and we're seeing a solution to that problem coming. We're also seeing photographers coming. I'm supposed to quote this ridiculous marketing line, things are coming together. I don't really like it, so I'm gonna go to the next slide and simply say thank you for your attention. Thank you for laughing every now and then. This is a how to find me. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to be running now because I have a board meeting uh, tomorrow um, uh, 3,000 miles away, but, um, and it's a long walk. Uh, but uh, there, there, um, there will be staff at the uh, Industrial Internet Consortium um, uh, booth here. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference, and I apologize for the photograph, which was taken 35 kilos ago. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, <Jamie. laughs> Thank you, Richard. It, it should be said this is the only gentleman you'll ever meet who actually travels alphabetically. He came from Barcelona. He's today in Berlin. He's on his way to Boston. That is tidiness. Richard Soli, thank you so much. <laughs>